welcome to today's presentation. My name is Mindy Hunthorpe and I am an academic advisor for the Master of Science in Operations Management program at the University of Arkansas. So today's presentation is brought to you as a part of a series that is the Engineering and Operations Management Lunch and Learn webinar series. That one is a mouthful. We do offer three online degree options through the Industrial Engineering Department and the College of Engineering. And today's presentation is the second of our full schedule. So this shows you the schedule and at the end of the presentation, we will send an email with this information out. But here's a good snapshot in case you're interested in any of the other presentations that we offer. So for today, I am proud to introduce to you Travis McNeil, who is the Director of Change Management and Strategic Communications for Walmart Supply Chain, and he is also an adjunct professor for our Master of Science and Operations Management program. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. So I'm going to take this off so that way it's not flapping around everywhere. <clears throat> um, and if I move off camera, be, keep me honest, because I know there's people joining us by phone. So um, what I thought we would uh, talk about today was leading through change, or you know, we're all experiencing a lot of change in our lives. So what does that look like in the organization with which we're a part of, and how do we as leaders more effectively lead through change. So just to give you some context of what we will be covering today, hopefully what you take out from the session is giving you a set of tools that will help you just quickly put those uh, tools into practice because we're, as we're going through change, I think sometimes we underestimate the advantage that we have when we go through changes from a leadership development point of view. And so that's what we're really gonna focus on today. How can we leverage that you know, crucible of organizational change to help improve the way in which we lead? How we'll frame up the next hour that we've got together is we'll start out with kind of the setting the stage. So what is, you know, when we go through change, what does that look like? What does that feel like? Then we'll talk about peak performance. So how do we leverage, you know, this skill, the, the, these times of change to help make us better leaders? Then we'll go through the importance of leadership. So you'll often hear, you know, regardless of whatever change management methodology or you know, that you hear, they often say that sponsorship is important. So then we'll, we'll spend some time on what sponsorship is and how that, what that means to us. Then we'll go through some key, through, go through the, what we call the behavior equation. So when, when organizations go through change, there's often a lot of things that get in the way of people adopting the new system, the new process, technology, whatever that is. So we'll go through what that might feel like. And then we'll talk about the three effective habits of leading change. Make sense? All right, let's roll then. So to help get this started, I'm gonna walk you back through. Um, back in uh, October 19th, 1781. So what happened back in October 19th, or October 19th, 1781, was the British were holed down in, in Yorktown, in the Yorktown Harbor. And at that point in time, they were completely surrounded. Uh, the, Brit the Americans and the French had surrounded them completely. General Cornwallis, who had held up the, who was responsible for the, um, for the British, um, British group there in Yorktown, uh, he was, um, he realized that he wasn't going to win. They had to surrender, and so at this point in time, when they had to surrender, you know, they were kind of frustrated. You might say They're, they should have won this battle. They they had every reason to win the entire Revolutionary War, but here they were, Battle of Yorktown, completely surrounded. They had to surrender. So what had actually happened is when you think, and why they felt they should have won, if you think back to even just three and a half years before that battle of Yorktown, what had happened is they, the Continental Army was almost defeated. You know, it, back in the winter of 1777, 1778, the entire Continental Army was pulled up in Valley Forge. And it, when they were, while they were there in Valley Forge, you know, their, their food supplies were running short. Supplies weren't getting in. The British had just taken the capital of the United States, Philadelphia. Um, they, there was sickness running all throughout Valley Forge. You know, I think at the end of it, there was around 2,000, 2000 soldiers who ended up dying. Um, and soldiers were deserting every day. And it was so bad that it got to the point where even uh, the, the French were wondering, are they, can they make it? Hold on. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. There we are. All right. So while, while they were held up Valley Forge, they, um, the, the British were, were kind of going all, all over the place. And they, they had full control over the entire Continental Army. And soldiers were deserting. 
And so what had happened then is George Washington wrote to Congress back then saying, you know, if we don't change the way in which we're running this war, we're either going to, our army's going to starve, we're going to dissolve, or our army's going to disband. That's how bad things were. So how did, how is it that the Continental Army got from where they were then to the point four years later where they actually beat the British at the, at the Battle of Yorktown? And so when you think about it, um, there was a lot of things that factored into it. And if you look back through history, a lot of historians will point to a number of different things that kind of contributed to why the Americans were able to win that battle or wh why they were able to win the Revolutionary War. But when you think about it, there, and, but most of them will agree that the events that unfolded at Valley Forge in 1777, 1778 were one of the turning points, or were a critical turning point for um, the Revolutionary War. And we can point to General Washington for sure. He played a big role in why we were able to overcome were the conditions that we were, but the one that often really credited with really driving this change was a guy by the name of Baron, Baron von Steuben, Frederick Baron von Steuben. <clears throat> and he um, was a down in his luck Prussian. He was from Prussia. They, Benjamin Franklin brought him over with the hopes to kind of rebuild this continental army. Um, and so he, at that point in time, led this massive transformation through the continental army. And so much that we, we know what the outcome was. But what was it that that General von Steuben did that helped kind of propel and make that change that needed to happen with that Continental Army. So that's what we're going to kind of walk through is what sorts of practices did he use that helped transform the, the Continental Army at that point in time. Because up until this point, the Continental Army was, they, they weren't doing that well. And they, they were winning battles, sure, but they also were losing a lot of battles as well. So there was all the reasons to say that the British were going to win. So let's kind of hear what actually happened then and some of the practices von Steuben used. Before we get too far into it, though, I'm going to ask you, and folks of you on, on the line, you can play as well. I'm going to ask you to join a poll. And so what, I'm, what I want you to do is get out your smartphones or open up a web browser, whichever you've got. And there's two ways that you can join this poll. And we've got four or five of these questions throughout the rest of the session. And so the ways you can join is you can go to your text message and text 22333. And then in that text message box, type Travis McNeil 414. Other way you can join is go to pollev.com backslash Travis McNeil 414. And we'll open up, I'm going to move, advance this screen next. The instructions will still be on the next screen, so when you see this go away, don't worry. And so, again, to text, type in Travis McNeil 414 at 22333, and then or polyv.com backslash Travis McNeil 414. The question I'd like for you to ask is, let's say you enter a meeting, and in this meeting, one of your leaders says, we are going to make some changes. What is the first word that comes to your mind? And let's keep it G-rated if we could. So type in a word that you would first, frustration, fear, ugh, good. Layoff. Great, okay. Fear. Hard, adaptation, oh. Very good. So as you see a lot of the responses that are coming up here, you'll see that by and large, a lot of them are pretty, um, are, you might say negative, might have a negative connotation associated with that. Now let me move to the next one. So if we go to the next question is, how much change would you say your organization is currently going through? None that I can think of, a few small changes and here and there. We've got a few important changes coming or we're in the midst of some really big disruptions. Very good. So as you see, change is stressful. There's a lot of change going on. So that's a combination of, so what do we do? There's, how, how do we navigate this environment where there's Change is kind of viewed, you know, stressful, plus there's a lot of it coming. So let's now move on to the help set the context for how we can apply that to our world as a leader. What I want you to do now is think about who are some greatest of all time um, people. And this can be open-ended, 
you know, you can see a few examples up here. Think about a basketball player, an artist, an educator, um, a leader, a military leader, football players. And I'm going to open it up for another poll. And what I want you to do is type in in that poll again who you would think. You know, when you think of the greatest of all time in any of those categories or others, let's see what you guys can come up with. Any others? Well, the, Jesus, okay. Michael Jordan, there we are. <coughs> Omar Bradley, <laughs> Obama, <laughs> Tesla, <laughs> Spears, Joe Montana, Jordan, Go, Van Gogh, Churchill, wow, there we go. Einstein, Churchill. Beautiful. So you guys clearly have an idea of what those greatest of all time are. Folks, let's see if there's any others. All right, MLK, fantastic. Powell. All right, so when you think about those folks that are, you would consider the greatest of all time, what is it that makes them the greatest of all time? My, Malcolm Gladwell, a few years back, wrote a book called Outliers, and in, in that book, he identified the Beatles as being one of the greatest bands of all time. And if you look back at some of their, what they, some of the records they've sold, clearly they're up at the top. And so, and he, he tried to identify what was it about the Beatles that made them one of the greatest of all time. And granted, the Beatles is just one example, but let me just kind of run that thread here for a moment. And so, one of the things that Malcolm Gladwell said that made the Beatles one of the greatest of all time was the fact that, you know, when they formed in the, in the early 50s or late 50s, early 60s, they were no different from any other band right out of high school. But there was a moment in time, a four-year period, that Malcolm Gladwell called the Hamburg Crucible, where during that period of time, the Beatles went to Hamburg, Germany, and they played, oh, I think it was over 1,200 shows over and over again, you know, night after night for six, seven, eight hours each time. So clearly during that period of time, they got really, really good. They went from a band that was okay to the Beatles, as we know them today. And so what was it that separated them from the rest of the group? Malcolm Gladwell popularized that term um, 10,000 hours. So when you think about it, what made them great? It was time. It was sure they were talented, sure all those other greats that were identified, yes, they were talented, but that talent doesn't translate to anything by itself. It has to be accompanied with time. And the 10,000 hours rule is what Malcolm Gladwell identified as kind of that critical threshold between what makes someone good and what makes someone great. Now he actually took that idea of 10,000 hours from um, a guy by the name of Anders Ericsson. And Anders Ericsson, yes, time is important, but it's more than just time. It's the quality of the time that's really what counts. Yes, you can have 10,000 hours in, but it's got to be focused on something. And he, he said that it's not practice that makes perfect. It's actually deliberate practice that makes perfect. And so when you think about, um, now that we have kind of that picture of what makes people great, as we look at ourselves and our leadership ability, do we take the time to deliberately practice our leadership skills? Do we take the time to really focus on those things that make us, that we know that make us a better leader? And with that, let's transition to um, some of the things that we can do. So when you think about, um, in my experience, and most of you can probably probably feel the same way, when you think about most leaders, my experience has been they want to be a good leader. Nobody wants to be a bad boss or a bad leader. They want to be good. They want to be as, as best as they can. You know, and if you think about it, most leaders, they take training classes, they um, attend seminars, they read books on how to fine tune and put a finer point on their leadership capabilities. And that's all well and good, it's important, gotta do it. What often happens though is then, these leaders then go back to work. You know, and with the best intentions to take everything that they've learned to make their teams better, to build the engagement with their teams, to make them a high-performing team. But then pressures begin to mount. Deadlines come up, emergencies arise, and <clears throat> sometimes as leaders, we worry about what people, what are leaders, what are, what others may think as we're trying to put a finer point on these leadership skills. Are we gonna look silly? And all of those reasons begin to crowd out 
kind of our efforts to try to put a finer point on our leadership skills. Does the narrative have to be that way? And I don't think that it does. And when you think about all the, all the changes that you said that your, your uh, organizations are going through, there's a lot of them. But it provides us with an opportunity to really think through, as we're going through this change, this, could this be my Hamburg crucible? Could this be the time where I put a finer point on, on really deliberately practice my leadership skills? So for the rest of the day, we're going to talk about how we wrap that up in the context of change leadership. <clears throat> so when you think about change management, as most of us know it, there's, so, there's a lot of people that play a role in making it effective. We have our executive sponsors on the top right-hand side. They're the ones who are responsible for setting the direction, providing the resources, providing the, the funding to be able to execute the strategy. On the bottom right side, you'll see the project team. You know, those are the folks that take the, the strategy and build the technology, the tools, the processes to execute that strategy. Bottom left-hand side, you'll see the, the associates in Walmart's case or the employees, wherever you might be. They're the ones who are kind of, the, they're the ones who have to execute it. On the top right-hand side, you'll have the leaders. The leaders are the ones who are responsible for making sure the associates adopt the new way of working. And we could spend an entire two days talking about the role that everyone plays to make that work. We don't have two days. We've got about 45 minutes now. So for the rest of our time together, let's focus in on what the leader's responsible is, what the leader's responsibility is, okay? <clears throat> so we'll focus on the leader. I'm worried that it's gonna, there we are. <clears throat> so next poll. So when you think about your own leadership ability, you know, on a scale, you know, how would you rate your leadership ability? It's going back there. It's just a little bit of a delay. And so there will be a poll that opens up that when you think about how you lead your teams during times of change, what would that be? One more. There we are. Perfect. No one's better than you. Top four. Uh, I did pretty good. I could use some help. Are you guys able to respond? Showing up? Okay. There we go. All right, looks like we got the result in. So clearly we can all use a, use a little bit finer point in our pencil. All right, let's go to the next one then. <clears throat> so when you think about um, one of the, what is it that makes change so hard? Um, John Cotter, who was one of the original um, founders of change management, you might say, you know, he wrote a couple seminal books as it relates to change management. Leading change was his first, the heart of change was his second. What he says is that, you know, it's never really the strategy, structure, or culture or systems. Yes, they're important, but when it comes down to it, it's really about changing people's behavior. <clears throat> That's the difficult part. And so when you think about what it is about changing behavior that makes it difficult, let's test that out ourselves. So for those of you on the, on the, on the phone, those of you in the room, we're going to ask you to go through a little bit of a change. So the change that I'm going to ask you to do is if you've got a watch, take it off from one hand and put it onto the other. If you don't have a watch, <clears throat> get your name badge, put it from one end to the other, or for those of you at home or on the phone, Maybe you've got a mouse next to you. Maybe move it from whatever side you're using it to your other side. <clears throat> so, and as you think about this, this is a little change. And if I'm a betting man, I'd bet that it feels a little bit uncomfortable. I'm looking at a few people around the room, kind of looking down at their hand a little bit more than they, struggling to get their watch on a little bit more. So, and it's not that this change is right or wrong, it's just different. You know, some people wear it on their left hand, some people wear it on their right hand. It's, it's just different. It's not how we typically operate. And so that, just that little change, even how uncomfortable it might feel, yeah, your watch feels a little bit heavier than it might have otherwise, that little change, if that's what we experience, just from a little tiny change like that, imagine what organizations and, and associates and employees feel like when, they're, when change is implemented in their organization that sometimes they have very little control over. So let's talk about that a little bit more. When we think, when we talk about organizations that go through change, there's a disruption that occurs. 
And when you think about it, life is great. You know, things are going well. Maybe there's a recognition that, yes, things are going well, but we can't stay the same. We've got to be different. So then the organization implements some sort of change. Maybe it's a restructure. Maybe it's a, um, you're implementing new technology, SAP, Workday. Um, maybe you're implementing a new process. There's some sort of announcement that things will change. Then comes a period afterwards where there's a reverberation. So people are still trying to figure this thing out. And when, the, when this reverberation occurs, there, you know, people do experience a loss of control. There's, and you will see resistance that occurs. And that just, it just comes with the change. It's just part of the way, it's not right, it's not wrong, it's just going to happen. For those of you who have kids, you probably know what that's like, that first day you bring that child home. If you have pets, you know what I'm talking you, you experience that same kind of reverberation. They're all good changes, but it doesn't make that reverberation any different. We have to relearn how, how we learn that new environment in which we're in. So we talked about resistance. Let's go down that thread just a little bit. When we, the main thing to take away from resistance is that resistance is perfectly normal. It's very easy, and we've all done it ourselves, where we say, if someone is being resistant, they're, they're bad. It's not necessarily that way. Resistance is normal. Um, it is dependent on one's perspective, meaning that, you know, when you roll out a new change, technology change, for a two-year two -year employee versus a 25-year employee, they're going to view it differently. Um, when you have a restructure, depending upon where people are in this structure, they're going to view it differently. And so all of these changes that we experience and the resistance that we feel is going to depend on where we, where we are in, in our own change journey. And it's just, it happens because of that disruption. Uh, Von Steuben and George Washington, when they were in Valley Forge, they experienced resistance. Yes, we know how the story ends, but those few days in Valley Forge, it wasn't easy. You know, there were times when about three weeks into their drills where things were really Make George Washington and Von Steuben could notice the difference. And so then they made, the, made it mandatory for all officers to attend training at 9 o'clock every single day. That didn't go over so well. And then there was another point where officers were not the ones that were responsible for uh, drilling their soldiers. They changed it to where the officers were now responsible for drilling their soldiers. You know, it was considered beneath the officer level to have to do that kind of work. And so when you think about it, you know, these – you're going to get resistance regardless of whatever change you're going to find. The idea is to, for those good leaders, they're the ones who work themselves through that reverberation that we saw earlier and then reach their hand back and bring the, those they lead along with them. All right? So let's talk about the commitment curve. So in a perfect world, you roll out a new program, and this is what it looks like. I'm hoping everybody says yes. There's some announcement. We're rolling out a new program, a new process, a new technology. When you roll it out, you explain it well enough to where there's a, everybody understands the reasons for it, they get it, they think that it's great. So there's a positive perception. That then leads to an understanding, a deepening understanding of what the program is, what it, is, what it isn't, and how it's going to impact people, and it's still considered good. So then you, that leads to buy-in. So then associates and managers, they, they buy into the program, and they're gonna do their, their part to make sure that this program works. That then leads to ownership, which is not only do they commit to doing their part, but they're also going to enlist others to help with the implementation. That's how it works, right? See some people laughing. Ideally, yes, but in reality, no. In reality, sometimes we may, instead of going off to the right, we may go off to the left. And so if we don't do a good job explaining things here, that could lead to, hmm, I don't know if this is going to be a good thing. If left unchecked, it could then lead to additional confusion. If still left unchecked, that could then lead to more outright avoidance, not wanting to have anything to do with that new process. If still left unchecked, that can then lead to outright defiance, where people no longer are just going to drag their heels. They're going to enlist everyone else to not go along with it as well. And so and when you think about a manager's role in this, they play a critical role at each area. And even if you have associates or managers that go off to one side, it doesn't mean they can't be brought back. It just means that it takes a little bit more calorie and a little bit more energy to bring them from the left side to the right side. Where managers will have the biggest bang for their buck is right down there at the beginning. The more that managers can explain what that looks like early on, then you have a greater chance of keeping, keeping associates onto the, onto the right-hand side. 
Okay. And if you're still not convinced yet at the criticality of leadership in times of change, here's a study done that was put on by Deloitte. Uh, they're a large international consulting firm. Um, they've helped thousands of companies through very large transformations. And when they conducted this study, they found that um, of all the programs that companies roll out, about 75% of them actually hit their targeted ROI. So if you think about a, project, a program that's expected to hit $100 million return, maybe it hits only $50 million return. And so if we are only getting 75% of our ROI for those projects, what's getting in the way? And there's a whole list of things that they identify. But if you look at the top three, you've got resistance by employees, inadequate sponsorship, and unrealistic expectations. Those three, and if you really drill underneath it, it's really about leadership. If leadership is more engaged during that period of time, resistance of associates goes down and unrealistic expectations go down as well. So clearly leadership plays a role in effectively driving change. So if we're not getting what we want from the changes that we need, that we expect, um, we can almost break it down to, is it a can't do problem or is it a won't do problem? And good leaders are the ones that really don't, it's not a, a manager, uh, it's not a, just because associates or managers aren't doing what we need them to do, it's not they're a bad associate or they're a bad manager. Maybe there's, they're the ones, good managers and leaders look at what's going on in the environment. What might not be in place that's not allowing those to meet expectations? And this is what we call the behavior equation here where if we've got an expectation over there that associates and managers do something, what's getting in the way? And if you think about it, the direction, which is really do associates know what they're asked to do, why they're asked to do it, what's in it for them, what good looks like. The next part of that is the competence. Do they have the skills, the knowledge, and abilities to meet those expectations? You know, you could ask me to go change the brakes on my car. By the end of the day, I promise you, I couldn't do it. I just don't have the skills. You could pay me a million dollars, and I still couldn't do it. In addition to the competence, there's the opportunity, which is, you know, do we have the right tools, the right technology, the right systems to be able to meet those expectations? You know, there's, uh, there's been several projects that I've seen roll out that require um, bandwidth, inter internet bandwidth. You can have the greatest technology available at your fingertips, but if you don't have Wi-Fi or internet connection, it's going to prevent you from doing what you need to do. <clears throat> and so if each one of these items are part of the can't do, and if, they, if you can meet each one of those items there and they still can't do it or they still don't do it, then it stops becoming a can't do issue and becomes more of a won't do issue. And that really leads to motivation. But the thing to be cautious with this, though, is that it's, it's still not looking at the associate. It's looking at what's, what's going on in the environment that can help that associate along. So for example, as managers, have we aligned all the, the, re, the incentives towards the new behavior or are they still aligned to the old behavior? So if you think about a, you know, there's lots of companies that preach safety, 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 but if it, at the end of the day, if people are rewarded for production and not safety, people are gonna focus on production and less on safety. And so that's why it's important to get those consequences and incentives aligned with the new behavior rather than the old. So with that all framed up, so then what good change leaders will then take all of that information. Um, actually, what I, let's do another poll here. So if you think about your organization, think about a project or a program that was rolled out recently, maybe within the last six months to a year. And which, if it wasn't, if, there, if it struggled at points in time, what would you say was the reason for it? You know, pick one of these. Was it a direction issue? Was it a competence? Or was it an opportunity? or was it a motivation? And yes, you can only pick one. I know you can probably pick two or three for any given program, but okay. Very good. But so clearly, uh, communications sounds like might be um, might be an issue in some programs, and clearly the follow-up might be an issue, or incentives in, in others might be might be an issue. Very good. 
So then if, if that, with that understanding of the DCOM, as what it's called, how do we then package that up to be able to lead our teams? If we know that those are the issues, how do we lead our teams better during times of change? And this next model, if there's just one slide, if I only had five minutes with the group today, this would be the one slide that I would hope that everyone takes away. We call this the Say Do Recognize. And so when you think about all the good change leaders that, that we've been exposed to, most of them have followed the Say Do Recognize to some degree. And I'll go into more detail with each one of those components, but when you think about the Say, it's really how well are the, is the what, the why, the how being explained during times of change. The Do is really, are we modeling what we're asking others to do? Are we allocating the resources? Are we giving folks time to be able to, to go through training? Are we enabling people to be successful? The recognized piece is all about the follow-up. And so when you look at each one of those, you'll see that the say is 1x, and the say part is important. Get it, gotta do it, gotta have it. But the do part is twice as important as the say part. And what we mean by that is, People can say what they want, but if they're not following it up with their examples and clearing the runway for folks, then it doesn't help the say part much. Most important though on that, or the most impactful in your change, I should say, is the recognize piece. And that's really a 3X, 3X of the do. And that means that it's very, very important once you implement something to follow up with folks. We'll go through that here in just a moment. So let's break down the say part first. So when you think about the say, key things to include as you're communicating is really what's changing, what's not changing, why is it important, what's in it for the associate or the manager, what's the plan, and what's next. When you can communicate those sorts of things about any given program with enough advance warning, that'll really help people understand their role and why we're going through this program. It's also important though, as you're communicating these, that managers make themselves, leaders make themselves available and visible. Remember that Individuals are going to react differently to change. Some may think that it's the greatest thing, others may not. And it's also important to anything you can share, you know, be authentic with, with um, those that you lead. Make sure they uh, see you as someone who's really trying to be, do what's right for them. And then anticipate the likely questions that come up. So there are always, people are always going to have questions. Try to anticipate as best you can what some of those questions may be, because they're most likely they'll have them. We going on a good pace? All right. So that's the say part. Got to do it, important. But let's talk about the do part here. So the do, just let me give you a few examples here. When you think about the do, it's really about providing the right tools uh, and allow time for training. Also engage in observation. It's one thing to be able to hear um, and look at data to be able to see are people on process but it's a very different thing to actually go down and make those observations for yourself. And then the next thing is address concerns quickly. If associates identify what's getting in their way and we don't do anything about it, that's gonna kill our credibility pretty quickly. So the do part is, is, is very important. The recognized piece is really the most critical, which is you know, positively recognize those associates who are on process, but it doesn't mean we, we also need to provide corrective feedback to those who aren't on process find out what's getting in the way, and then recognize progress or recognize progress early on rather than perfection. If you think about when you've learned a new language or picked up a new skill, it doesn't happen overnight. It does take time, and we owe it to, our, to those, that, those that we lead to be able to give them time to practice and get better at the skill that we're asking them to do. So you'll see up here there's a, a helpful tip ratio of four to one. So I'm just gonna ask the group here in the room when we talk about a four to one ratio, that's what the behavioral science experts say is the right mix. Is there any guesses as to why that mix is considered a good mix? Easier to hear the corrective when you've heard positive already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As humans, we just naturally tend to gravitate towards the negative. And even if we did a two to one ratio, we're still gonna focus on the negative. And so enriching the positive versus the negative helps people realize, okay, I am doing things right. Um, so it helps, and, and, and it also establishes your credibility as a leader that you're not out to get them. You're simply trying to make them better. So in that way, when you do have to give that, 
one-time corrective feedback, which we've all got to do, it, it, it's seen as helpful. It's not seen as being someone trying to, trying to point out all our flaws. Okay, does that make sense so far? All right. So let me kind of frame it up by how Von Steuben approached the Say Do Recognize. Now, he clearly didn't know that this is what he was doing, but if you look at what he did during the time at Valley Forge, he was clearly following the Say Do Recognize model. Um, first thing that he did is when he um, first arrived on site, um, he, had, he brought with him volumes of documents and drill manuals that he could make this army great. However, he knew that this army was not in a position to hear everything. So he had to cherry pick the very few critical items that he had to take, had to take a complex bunch of information and boil it down to the critical few steps. He also recognized very early on that the American soldiers were very different from the European soldiers where he came from. The European soldiers were very take direction, take orders, and go. Yes, this U.S. soldiers were that way too, but they also wanted to know the why. They will be willing to do what you need them to, but just tell us why you're asking us to do it this way. And it was interesting to hear that Von Schuben recognized that early on in his um, time at Valley Forge. When it came to the do piece, one of the things that um, Von Steuben did is he expected discipline. He expected regimentation and following orders. But he also was very disciplined himself. So he awoke every morning at 3 a.m., had his cigar, had his coffee, and prepared his lesson for the day. And so he clearly lived his own values. The uniforms that he wore were perfectly pressed, iron, and he walked straight and upright and was, you know, practiced his, the way he lived with great precision. He expected that of everyone else. The most important thing that he did, though, is he observed everything. So anytime there was drilling going on, he was out there. He wasn't standing off, you know, expecting it to be done. He was watching and looking at how everything was being executed. Then you get to the recognized piece. I know it sounds sound simple. He was very fanatical about providing constructive feedback. And he was very well known for his uh, foul language. He used it to great effect. Um, but he, and he provided very quick, very direct feedback when people weren't following the drills as he asked them to. But he was also very lavish with his praise. So when people were following, he lavished praise all over those, those soldiers who were doing what he asked them to do. So he was walking that fine line very, very well. And then he made it fun for them. And so when he was drilling, he started out with his officers. So there was 120 officers. Those, that was the first group that, that he started drilling with. And he did it in plain view of everyone where they could watch these group of officers stumble and make mistakes. And he made it fun for them. And they actually got a, they enjoyed watching it. It provided a good little bit of relief from the tough times they had at Valley Forge. So that's how Von Steuben approached this. They do recognize with his, um, with his Army Valley Forge. And so the last piece that we'll talk about is when you think about you as a change leader, maybe you are the best change leader there is. And maybe after today, you're even more convinced that you are the best change leader there is. And that's okay. But what about those leaders that are under you? Are they the kind of change leader you are? You know, do they, can they be you in terms of change leadership? And that's that's where we, we talk about the sponsorship spine. And that's where you may be the best change leader, but how do we get those that are underneath us to be that change leader themselves? Because it is, being a change leader is not a de something we can delegate to someone else. It's something we've got to own. And we've got to ensure that those, that sponsorship spine throughout the organization is certainly capable of leading change. It is, not, it is an uninter uninterrupted line of leadership. The good thing about it though, is that it can be learned. It's not rocket science. It's certainly hard to do, but it can be learned. And when you, again, what I mentioned about Von Steuben is that he set up that sponsorship spine by enlisting those 120 officers at first. Those were the group that he started out with to make them the experts. Then he sent them out into the rest of their regiments and expected them to do the exact same thing. And that's when he went around following up with each one of those. He, he would watch them. He would observe them. When they weren't doing it well, he would correct them. And when they were doing it well, he would praise them. But he was very much engaged in that. But that was certainly the leader's responsibility, the officer's responsibility to then cascade that into their, into their teams. So, so as you know, change will continue. Um, 
you, you identified earlier that change is going to keep, keep hitting organizations. It's going to keep hitting you. And so when you are faced with these changes that come your way, we're faced with a choice. You know, what do we do? Do we sit back and let these changes come to us? Or do we take these changes as an opportunity to really deliberately practice some of the skills that we need? And when you think about it, when we take the time to deliver, deliberately practice these skills, these changes can actually become our hammer crucible. We can actually take these, take these changes as a way to deliberately practice and focus on leading our teams, which will then um, allow us to add one more tool to our toolbox, which is the Say Do Recognize. If we can use that, I've seen it work too many times, where leaders that follow that simple Say Do Recognize over and over again, time after time, they will become a better change leader. And when we can practice that ability, we can then bring our teams to the forefront and make, engage them in ways that we never thought possible. But we've gotta be willing to reach back, grab their hand and bring them along as we go through these changes that we're faced with. One more coming up. I know if I hit it a few more times, it's going to, oh, it's up there. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So in closing, uh, let me just kind of leave you with kind of where the story went from um, with Washington and von Steuben. So summer of uh, 1778, Washington was really anxious to see you know, all this time that we spent drilling and practicing in Valley Forge, does, is it going to help? And so they went to, um, at that point in time, the British were leaving Philadelphia and they were headed up to New York. While they were headed up to New York, Washington thought this is a perfect time to head them off while they're heading up there. <clears throat> and as they were heading up there, they got about two, two, uh, two hours into the battle and they were in retreat. The army was getting whipped. And so, and what had happened is General Lee, who was actually, you know, uh, he was a resistor, you might say, as we've learned, he resisted some of the efforts from von Steuben and, or, and Washington that he was, um, he was not executing the way he needed to have been. Washington and von Steuben arrived to the battle about two to three hours later, and as they were arriving to the battle, they saw the soldiers going the opposite direction. But something was different this time than it was in the past. <clears throat> this time, as these soldiers were retreating, they still had their muskets and they still had their backpacks. As they, which in previous battles, they would leave them to the battlefield, trying to get away from the battle as quickly as they could, but they still had those. The look on the soldiers' faces was not one of fear or terror like it was before. It was more one of frustration. And so Washington and von Steuben saw this and they actually heard some soldiers kind of um, questioning the call to retreat that General Lee had asked for. He had asked for the full retreat. They were questioning. At that point in time, Washington and von Steuben realized, hey, we can still win this because the soldiers wanted to fight, but they were being told to retreat. And so quickly, Washington re relieved General Lee of command. Washington and von Steuben took over. They started calling out orders and they started getting the troops rallied. And they, the troops started making their formation. They started firing in the orchestrated way, just like they had learned. They had repelled several British um, musket charges or bayonet charges. And all, and by the end of the day, the British realized they weren't gaining any ground. So they broke off and headed back up to New York. Now, technically it was considered a draw, but what was actually learned that day was the fact that the British, the Continental Army realized, and so did the British at that point in time, that hey, these Continental Army, they can, we can go toe to toe with them. You know, we can actually, we can stand our own ground. Up until this point in time in the war, the Continental Army had fought with bravery and they fought with ferocity, but this time at Monmouth, they'd actually fought with uh, discipline. They had, were disciplined in how they approached it. They didn't retreat. They didn't have that fog of war like they typically do. And so when you think about von Steuben and Washington and the effort they put in at Valley Forge, what they did at Valley Forge was practice that say, do, recognize model. And so my hope is, is that as we go through our own change journey, our own change management, that we can look to a down on his luck Prussian and, um, and Washington realize the kind of change leadership that we ourselves can be capable of. Thank you. All right. Any questions from the phone? Yeah, sure. Yeah, 
or they can type their questions in the chat if that's available. They are our friends. They are our friends. We tell them what they ask. And that's okay, maybe we mute them again. <laughs> if anybody needs to ask a question. stage has to be like um you know as are going through change management there's like trying are trying to communicate as, as much information as possible but there's still a bit of resistance and we're not getting over that curve and we have people maybe migrating to the avoidance or to the uh, uh denial mm -hmm. how long of an acceptance or how can we as leaders need to when uh associates to you know go to this side of the, the curve on kind of accept Mm -hmm. From my experience, when I've seen leaders at the different companies I've been a part of, um, it's it's two things really. It's listening to what the associate's concern is, because oftentimes I think it's more of an, an you know we're going to impose this new change on you. But sometimes what the associates say might have some validity. And if leaders, I found that leaders that do really good at listening to see what's what's truly the issue, and then able to resolve that issue, it brings them back over a little bit more. And sometimes it just takes time. And you know, most of you guys probably all know this, but it's each associate is different. They're at different stages and require different things to move back over. And that's where it really tests our leadership skills to understand what is it that associate needs to bring them back over a little bit more. Does that help? Okay. Okay. You got questions coming? While we're waiting on questions, if you enjoyed, I'll pop back in here. Um, if you enjoyed what you heard today and you enjoyed today's presentation, this is just a small snippet of what you would learn in a class in the operations management program or engineering management or even our graduate certificate in project management. So if you're interested in any of those programs, uh, my colleague Ashley Lees is here in the back of the room. She's also an academic advisor for that program. So we've got a full team of advisors here to help. And if you're interested in those programs, please do let me know. My contact information um, will be on the next slide, and you've seen it there. And do we have questions? Yes. Hey, Travis, if somebody wants to know if there's any other good books you could recommend on change management. Yeah, Switch is probably my, one of my favorites. Um, I think Switch is a good one. Adcar is another uh, popular one that most people recognize. Say that again, Switch okay. by Chip and Dan Heath. Very easy read, um, even for me. And I'm not a not a very quick reader, but it, it's a it's a good read. Teaches some really applicable, simple concepts. Any other questions? Well, I'll tell you what. We'll still be on the line for another five minutes or so. So if there are questions, we'll excuse everyone. But I'll be on the line for another five minutes longer if there are other questions that come up. All right? All right. Adjourn. Thank you. For everyone in the room, please. And thank you to Walmart and everyone for letting us host this here. The next webinar will be October 25th, and that will be on unmanned aircraft systems. And all of that will be posted. It's posted on our website, and we will send a video of today's recording after the presentation, but we do have a drawing for those who are in the room today. So this is a drawing. So we do have a prize pack since you all spent your lunch break with us today. Is this going to be in the room? Yes. Okay. Oh, she's not. Shelly Mayberry? No, she's not here. We're going to get one. Must be present to win. Clayton? Clayton Adams, Molly, Molly, Molly. Oh, <laughs>